All right, Mike, we're live. Yes, sir. Live from the shop in Fergus once again. Grand River Outfitting. Yep. The heart, in the heart of Fergus, in the heart of Grand River territory. This is Mikey Metcalf. I'm Mark Melnick. Uh, welcome to Tight Lines and Tailing Loops. It's always great to see you. Yeah, man. It's been too long. It has. You know, Mike and I uh, started fishing together probably six or seven years ago, uh, fishing steelhead and, mm -hmm. and a variety of things. And, um, you know, we were both really busy with work and uh it just doesn't happen nearly as as much as it's as it should does it yeah uh, last time i saw it i couldn't believe how long it's been since i seen you well, well you're looking good man drop a yeah, bunch of bunch of weight and trying to get ready for opener that's the ticket though right eight days 30, 30. 37 days and 12 hours to four, be exact. four minutes and whatever um you're looking forward to it obviously oh yeah yeah. Yeah. All right, we're talking to the uh, <coughs> sh shop owner um, this morning here, Rob Heal. He's got his first guided trip uh, coming up uh, in two days. So he's pumped about that. And they're, they're going to be doing a bunch of fly tying yeah. sessions here at the shop in the next little while. Yeah. Most Saturdays, um, you know, some, one of the tires comes in on Saturday. They pair it up usually with uh, one of the local microbreweries or they had Glen, uh, Glen Livid in one day. Oh, that's great. That's perfect. It's, you know, I get to see everyone from the river and and uh, have some beers, tie some flies. Keeps the camaraderie up. Oh yeah. It's nice seeing everyone too, because you're used to seeing them on the river. Yeah. Yeah. And just come in and have a couple beers and... That's one of the things that I love about when, uh, you know, when Mike and I fun fish together is, uh, and very much so for Rob as well, is is it's, sure the fishing's fun and the fishing's part of it and it's the canvas and the reason, but really it's it's pals on the road. I mean, remember that day that we, we went out to uh, the Wilmot and ended up, you know, sitting sitting on the on the bank of the river and <coughs> had a bonfire and a barbecue and yeah, all yeah. that stuff that's what it's all about man you know it sounds it sounds corny but it, it's so true like the, the, the older you get um like i can't even tell you how many times i go out there after dinner and we're just sitting on the bank and yeah you go out to fish and you see somebody you haven't seen in a while and yeah yeah all right armin so bishop miller good afternoon mr bishop miller from upstate new york nice to see you yeah i'll be heading there soon yeah, us too, us as well. Uh, ramping up for the new fly fisher um, really quickly here. Um, Wyoming, Maine, Florida, Ontario. Wow. Yeah, it's going to be great. Anyway, we're here to do tight lines and tailing loops. Uh, <laughs> um, a great opportunity to get to know local guides and people that are influential in the fly fishing industry. Yeah. Um, uh, so I'm an independent guide, but this is my home shop. Right, absolutely. So, so, so Grammar... Yeah. Go yeah, ahead. Grand River Outfitting here in Fergus, um, like we got a great business re uh, relationship. Yeah. But I'm also very close friends with Rob and Scott and Tanya, so awesome. It's a great relationship. Awesome. Um, you weren't always a fly guide, though, were you? No. Um, I've been fly fishing probably about 18 years. Um, you, you know, it's funny. A lot of people here, you start fishing in Ontario, fishing bass and walleye and spinning gear and that and, and we were kind of raised to think that fly fishing was kind of like that's an elitist thing we don't do it you know so it's yeah. kind of out of sight out of mind there was no youtube there's no social media there's nothing and uh a friend of mine is from argentina and i used to go bass fishing all the time yeah so so one day i you know looking in the back of his car i see a fly rod i'm like oh like Hoity toity like look at, the <laughs> look at the hat you're wearing now so so i uh <laughs> So we would go bass fishing and I'd go up to his car and get his fly rod and I'd start, you know, his name was uh, Roberto Ogin and, uh, you know, he, he's the one who put the fly rod in my hands and, and you know, I remember it to this day, it, it, everything just turned like yeah. you know, a common man can do it and, yeah. and then, you know, you just start talking, you get immersed into it and um, so I started steelhead, you know, started with the steelhead with the fly rod and um, I wanted to get more into the browns. Yeah. You know, it was, it was one of those fish that were out of my arsenal, like where I was raised, we didn't have a lot of them. So I started going out with Graham Bristow, mm -hmm. um, maybe 10 years ago to really start to really zero me in on the browns. He, he's phenomenal. Like, really Patrick Cameron, Mike, you roll up the rim to see what you want. <laughs> Later. <laughs> Free reel. <laughs> so, uh, so he really, he really educated me on, on, going after resident browns and um so that was you know probably over a decade ago yeah and uh so then i, I think he he got injured or something about you know going back like 
seven, eight years, I started doing like guiding for him. I started going in and then I started guiding for him. Yeah. Then I started guiding more and I was still holding the nine to five. Yeah. You know, I was working at like crazy hours, all, all my vacation time, weekends, I was doing just guiding. So I was just going seven days a week. Yeah. And um, probably about maybe four, four or five years ago, maybe, I think four years ago or so, yeah. I was feeling really, really tired. And I didn't know what it was. I went in to see my doctor and I was just telling, telling her how tired I was. Yeah. So she goes over, she, she's like, before we go, we should take your blood pressure. She goes, hits the machine. She's looking at it. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. Gets up, she hits the machine again. I'm like, what's happening here? She leaves the room. Two doctors come into the room. Right. I'm like, what's going on? Yeah. Don't know how to tell you this. Your blood pressure is way higher than stroke victims. Wow. Like this, this all came right out of the blue. Yeah. So I was like, like, I was starting to freak out. You know, what's happening? They said, we don't know. So they wouldn't let me leave the doctor's office. Yeah. They put me on meds, told me to rest for five weeks. So you had to leave work. I had to leave work yeah. instantly. They, she took my phone and turned it off and faxed my company. Right. Like it was, it was a critical status, you know? So after five weeks, they, they were able to maintain my, my blood pressure. And, um, you know, it got back to the point, like, what do I do? Yeah. And I will never forget this. The way my doctor looked at me was, here's your two choices. I'm going to see you in three months. You've either changed your life or you're, you're going to get pushed in here in a wheelchair. Right. If you haven't stroked out. Right. And the way she said, and you don't want to see how many people have been pushed into my office. Yeah. I got up, I walked out of there. I never returned to that job. Yeah, you quit. I never even set foot in the place ever again. Right. You know, I was already up here and then I just said, you know, I just changed my entire life. Um, started guiding and Con conti now. continued guiding. So Mike, Mike is one of the few so. guys in Ontario that is able to um, guide full time. Uh, he's got his fingers on the pulse of everything, fly fishing in this region, um, and you know, having fish, fun fished with you. I mean, you're, you're a master of your art for real. But what I love about this story, and the reason why we're telling this story, mm -hmm. is because you're not the only one. You're not the only one that, that has had... I couldn't believe how many people I talked to on the river that are kind of going through the same thing. Right, and fly fishing literally saved Mike's it life. Literally it did. literally did. And it's not the first time we've seen it. I remember Mike and I were down, down with Rob Heal as well, down on the Niagara River. And um, a father and a son yeah. was fishing in a spot that we wanted to fish. And we went in and we, yeah. and we asked very nicely if we could fish downstream from them, right? It turns out that father-son team um, were into, look like a goosebumps telling the story, were, yeah. were fly fishing because the son was a, severely addicted to drugs. Yeah, he was, like he like was on death's door. Yeah, he was battling big right. time. And we fished, we fished with that kid and his dad and at the end of the at the end of the day, um, we got to, we got quite friendly with them. And at the end of the day, the kid came up to us and said um, something along the lines of, "Hey guys, if I ever need, if I ever need you, can can I call on you?" Right? Mm -hmm. it, it was weird. It happened real fast. Still and friends with them. Still friends day. with them today. And yeah. Mikey and I were actually a reference for this kid to get his to get a job. Still clean, and saved his life. Another story, real quick, is um, a guide friend of mine up in the far north was in a bad shape because of, of suicide. And, uh, you know, he turned it around and fly fishing saved his life. So there's a reason why we do this. Yeah. And it just- river, river therapy. River therapy, exactly. All right, let's get on to the meat of why we're here. Um, trout season is about to begin in just over a month. Yeah. You're amped. I wish I was so going so. to be amped, but I will not be Especially in Ontario. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's talk about trout fishing and specifically brown trout fishing in the area. Uh, first of all, the basics of it, where do you begin? What's the season here for browns, um, both on paper and ethically? Uh, season opens uh, fourth Saturday in April and it goes to the last day in September. Um, this river is so... Um, Which river are you talking about? This is the Grand River here in Fergus. Yep. Um, it's probably one of the most publicly accept, uh, accessible rivers in southern Ontario. It's, it's just geared for the people coming up to fish it. Um, there's probably, I'd say about 18 or so access points 
Mm -hmm. um, the stretch here, it's a 23 kilometer stretch and it's a uh, special regulation. So we got single barbless, mm -hmm. artificial only, mm -hmm. catch and release only. Mm -hmm. Other than, I think there's about three spots within that 23 kilometers. So we got from second line up to the dam is uh, re regular provincial regulations. Um, everything's contained in town here. It's great for kids to, you know, you know, they can fish with bobber minnow. Yeah. It's stock for them. So it's not just fly fishing only. You can, no, you no, can fish species, conventional as well. Yeah. Yeah. Re just regular provincial regulations. Yeah. Um, you know, fish, minnows, worms, leeches, whatever you want. Um, within the three bridges in town here, mm -hmm. and then downstream into the Allure Gorge. Other than that, it's it's uh, special regs. Right. Uh, it's not crowded up here. Right. And it's open to the public. Yeah. No private water. Not that I know of, no. Right. Where you fish anyway. So any any if you just come up here, like I, I can't tell you how many people send me DMs like, you know, I'm just looking for an access point. Yeah. Um, literally anywhere from Fergus down to West Montrose, you could catch fish in any of these sections. Are they all stocked? Right from head to toe. Yeah. Twenty-five thousand a year we put in. Twenty-five. Is there any natural reproduction on this river? Uh, I'm not very up to date with the numbers with that. I know there is some. Mm -hmm. um, and how do how do the hatchery fish fare? Because a lot of times hatchery fish, when they're introduced to a wild system, they have a hard time in adapting to to that wild system. Do the or do the fish generally, you know, fare well? Are there high numbers of fish per kilometer? Yes. Um, well, when you think about it, we got twenty-five thousand fish. Yeah. three kilometers it's a thousand a kilometer down yeah and i think in that that's that's almost blue ribbon status really it's, it's incredible like i can't even tell you how many times um i've been with a client kind of just uh standing around with waders on and and people asking you know where were you guys fishing oh, five minutes from here then i asked where are you from well we're from fergus and i'm standing with somebody who came up from ohio yeah so they're coming up here they're traveling eight hours to fish the river yeah and it's kind of just under everyone's nose here. Yeah. It's hey. definitely blue, uh, blue ribbon water. Hey, Mike, here's a, here's a note from Sean Baker. I had no idea of what you've gone through, Mike. Thank you for sharing. You changed my life exponentially, and I can't wait to get back on the river with you. You know, this guy here, he's one of those people. I, I guided him on the river last year, and uh, it, it's probably my favorite thing about guiding is you watch the progression of people. Yeah. And he's just dove right into it. You see him, at, he's here at all the tying events. Yeah. He's he's out there. He's amped. I love it. It's probably the best thing you could see as a guide. Nice, nice. Um, so back to brown trout. Um, so the season length, the season begins the fourth April, fourth Saturday, Saturday in April. In April. Yeah. Um, and when does it end? And it, can September. you fish the entire the entire summer? So we uh, we start getting going. Um, we start getting going. Usually it takes a couple weeks. Uh, for the water to warm up a bit when we start getting into the, you know, the, the first hatch. So usually the first couple of weeks of the season, we're nymphing, mm -hmm. streamer fishing. You know, you'll see some BWOs on the air um, here and there. Um, probably about maybe the second weekend of May, mm -hmm. you're going to get the first hatch of the year. So when the water gets around 52, 53, that's when you're going to start seeing the big Hendrickson hatch. So, so before that, though, do you, is, it, is it typical of, of any sort of lethargic cold water system fish in that system that you really need to slow your presentations down? Um, um, uh, like, do you, are you stripping these? these oh, yeah, yeah. You're, we're, you're moving we're going it? hard, yeah. Okay, so yeah. it's not like that at all. You're looking for a reaction. You're looking, looking for these yeah, fish to the chase first, bait. The first two weeks of the season, we're throwing a lot of meat. Okay. Um, and then if you're a dry fly angler, um, the, the Hendrickson's is, is kind of what sets off the, the dry fly season. Right. Um, it's the first like significant hatch of the year. Um, it's epic when you get like a big Hendrickson hatch, you could see just, it just clouds up. You could just see, you know, you get a backdrop of like the cedars. Yeah. You know, two, two thirty three in the afternoon, they go off and then that kind of signifies the season. So, um, you know, I get I get a lot of questions all the time about, you know, when are the hatches and everything. And I always tell somebody who's just kind of like a novice getting into it, it's trying to get into the dry fly game, is um, there's all kinds of literature online. Mm -hmm. um, you could pull off these hatch charts. If you just Google Grand River hatch chart, you will see, uh, you'll get a lowdown on what's happening in order with the hatches. And if you're kind of a novice, it doesn't hurt to to get one of those laminated and just have a little cheat sheet. Yep. And then just start getting on the river 
and uh, you could kind of start putting together some of the hatches. Like you'll see here, second week in May, Hendrickson's are going to kick off. I think it's really strong, and then we get into the, uh, you know, the foxes and things like that. But so that that starts it off. That's probably two weeks into it, and then and then, you know, it goes Hendrickson's, and then into the foxes, and then we start seeing caddis. Then it goes into Cahill's, the BWOs are around, and uh, we kind of go right through. Mm -hmm. But we're always taking the temps of the water. Right. So we start to slow it down on the river. Um, we'll start to really start temping the water probably mid to late July. And then as we get into August, when the temps start to get around 68, 69, mm -hmm. um, we start to, to lay back on them. Um, if we're going to fish at those temps, we usually get out first thing in the morning and we're off the water by nine o'clock. Right. Just, and, and, and that's just, strictly, just, just strictly strict it ethically. Right. And that's for the safety of these fish. As soon as that water gets get warm. stressed out and they have a really hard time re recuperating. Yeah. So, um, if you are going to fish in those temps, um, you know, the ideal thing is get them as fast as you can and get them back in the water. But as a guide, we, we tend to lay off and then we, uh, we'll let them rest, um, you know, usually through the month of August, it's kind of like the dog days of summer. We'll switch over and start fishing smallmouth. That's what I was going to say. Your guiding season isn't over in August. Yeah, it, we'll it really ramps it up. up. We'll, we'll let them rest. We'll leave them alone. And then we'll, we'll, go, we'll start going after smallmouth. Yeah. Um, you know, above the lakes, up towards Grand Valley, you know, down below, downstream, there's all kinds of incredible bass water up here. And then as we start getting into September, you know, we start getting those, those days where you're kind of putting on a hoodie. Yeah. And um, one of my favorite times to fish this region really is. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's really great. If anybody has any questions for Mike, we are live on Facebook, obviously. Please yes. feel free to ask away. Um, I'm, I'm not being rude. I'm actually monitoring things here on the computer. So uh, any questions for Mike about the, the general area and hatches and, and what to expect on a brown trout um, uh, yeah. trip? Uh, let's let's talk about that. You know, you, you've been doing this a while now. You professional guide. Um, all season long. Mm -hmm. What's a typical trip um, hold for you at peak season? You know what? You could take out 10 people yeah. and have 10 different experiences out there. Yeah. You know, the whole key to guiding is it's not about me that day. It's about what they're looking to do. Mm -hmm. And you know, I always get asked tons of questions of people, you know, what do you think a successful angler is? And, you know, someone who's a great fly fisher. The answer is if you accomplish what you're trying to do that day, if you have somebody that's working 80 hours a week, you know, they're just going and going and going and going, and, and they just want to get out, get their three weight, throw, catch whatever, sometimes just sit in the bank and watch. That person's successful. Yeah. So, um, you know, we get everything from the diehard looking for the trophy brown to someone just getting out to people just getting into it. Um, getting into fly fishing can be a little bit intimidating, so we have special courses for them, you know, like an introduction to fly fishing, mm -hmm. and then everything in the middle. like. You know, what are you looking to do? Are you looking to nymph, streamer fish, dry fly fish? Um, the, the river really starts to light up the last week of May, going right into June. Yeah. June's amazing. Like, if you had one week to book vacation, I'd say take the first week of June. First week of June. So that, that brings up an interesting point. You talked about this, the, the casting lessons and the casting schools. Um, one of the things that, that we try to do at the new fly fisher is to educate people such that fly fishing is not an elitist sport. It's exactly. not something it's that, changed. yeah, it's, it's totally so changed. changed. It's not something that, you know, you have to go to your grandfather's fly shop and drop $1,200 exactly. $1, on a rod, that's true. that kind of thing. So the way that I like to put it is that anything that swims and anything that eats can be caught on fly. 100%. Whether it's a, a creek chub or a 1,500 pound blue marlin, right? Anything that swims can be caught on fly. And there are companies out there that have understood this and they're breaking down the barriers to admission so that people who want to get into fly fishing can do so. I know here at the shop, they have preset kits yep. that you can come in and buy. If you, you know, if, the best way to do it is to, is to take a, is to, is to hire a guide and to see if you like it. But if you do like it and you want to get involved in it, this is what you do. You start out, you buy a starter kit to make sure, you know, less than 200 the, bucks. These starter kits now are um, as good as the be like some of the top of the line uh, rods yeah 20 years ago yeah exactly they're amazing right they, just, uh, they come with a real line rod yeah and then once um, and then once you pick up your kit call mike mike's a triple f certified fly fishing instructor mm -hmm. which means that he can undo a lot of the bad habits that people start out with right out of the gate yeah. so that it's you're just like, it's just like golf yeah exactly right yeah you want you want to take up golf best thing to do is take um 
take a lesson. Yep. Okay, let's keep talking brown trout. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had a ton of snow um, this winter here in the region. Uh, there's still snow on the ground as, as I speak now. Um, let's talk about water flows in the beginning and what that does to the fish and what's ideal. What do you look for? So there's two things with fishing browns up here. You're basically acting like a stockbroker. You're online looking at flows and temps okay. all day long. Right. Um, there's a website you could go on to up here that we, it's real time. Mm -hmm. It's the GRCA. Um, so this this fishery up here is a tailwater. Okay. Which means for some people that may not know. So it, the, the flows are controlled by the dam, right. Shan Dam. The flows come out from the bottom of the, they release it from the bottom. That's, you know, the tailwater keeps yep. everything cool. Yeah. So the water up here stands, uh, tends to stay colder than most natural creeks. <clears throat> so, colder longer, which is key. Yes. So the ideal, I would say the ideal summer flow, uh, it, you know, it depends who you talk to. I like fishing it around uh, seven. The, so the, the standard summer, summer flow would be 5.5 CMS cubic meters a second. Um, and we fish it. You know, I like it when it's up around 10. I like to, you could really nymph, like the water gets up, it's a little fast. You could get nice pocket water and nymph it. Um, once it starts getting up over 10, I'd say over 12, it starts to get a little dodgy. Mm -hmm. um, not to say you can't fish it. You, you know, there's places you could go down and fish, but you're kind of parking it here and I could fish for an hour, but I'm not waiting it. So um, just go online, you look at the flows, it'll save you a trip up here. You know, we didn't have this stuff years ago. Yeah. We used to make the drive. Yeah. Uh, now you could just say, like, even with Steelhead, you see a lot of people saying, let's go fishing on Saturday. We don't know where yet. Let's decide on Thursday. Yeah, yeah. what the flows are. So go on the GRCA. You could pull it up. It's real time. Uh, anything, if you see, like, f you know, 4.5 4 up to 10, uh, the novice person just could come out and, who doesn't know the river and get around and, move, and it's safe. Right. And the fishing is great, you know, great doesn't matter. Right. And conversely, if, if, if you do have a trip booked and things are blown out or things aren't going to provide you for your ideal fishery, your fishing day, uh, you'll cancel, won't you? hundred percent. If yeah. I'm not fishing it personally, I would never charge a person to fish it. Right. Right. Um, so now that we're on the river, um, we've got a couple of different options for presentation. What, what in your days is your go-to beginning? What, what do you want to start with? When I'm guiding or if I'm personally fishing? Either or. Well, I'm a dry fly snob by nature. Uh, I love I love throwing dry flies. That's that's my passion. Yeah. Um, now, are you talking terrestrials or are you talking dries? Drives. Okay. So yeah. you're fine. You're fine. Fine fishing. Finesse fishing. I love it. I love I love going out there with a, with a light rod, small flies, and throwing them to rising trout. Mm -hmm. I'm also okay with the fact that. I go out there and you know, there's an expression, there's a fine line uh, between standing in a river and looking like a fool and, and dry fly fishing. Because <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I go out there and, and I don't even make a cast. Yeah. Uh, but it's the game I choose to play. Yeah. So. Well, remember we, we fished last fall yeah. in the area, in, in this area, and it was the three of you, me and, and Robbie. And um, we literally didn't throw a fly. Yeah, for four hours we were just we were waiting for that hatch to come off and and yeah. it just it just didn't happen but you know what it was one of the one of the more fun days it's I've all had part of it. like i like just seeing hatches i like sitting on the bank i watch the birds but so if i'm guiding you know some people are traveling two three hours you know it's hard for me to say uh how was your drive you want to go sit on the bank for four hours and yeah. see if there's a hatch yeah so what we what i would usually do is you know we start the day we will start nymphing and then hopefully when we're on the river so much, we start gearing in on when the hatches are. Yeah. So there's always a chance of catching a hatch while we're fishing. Right. And when I'm personally fishing, I'm fine with just sitting on the bank, um, make two casts a night. Yeah. Some of the biggest fish I've ever caught come within two casts. Mm -hmm. That's all I've casted the entire four hours. Yeah. And what I like about your system is, especially out of the shop, is that you guys have the, the, the entire system mapped such that you know that if there's a, uh, a hatch, a caddis hatch going off at this point in the river, you know that literally two weeks later to the day, for example, 
that it'll be in a different spot down down the creek. This this place here is like uh, it's like the brain center of the river. Right. There's people coming in and out all day long. Even if they don't know what they're talking about, they'll say, "Oh, I saw these big flies in here." Yeah. Right in my head, I'm like, "Oh, the Hendrix are going on." <laughs> a little note to sell. I need a moment. <clears throat> so what we usually start to do is, you know, with the Hendrixons, we start the season downstream, way down there, mm -hmm. and um, so we catch the fit. You know, we catch a hatch here, and then we move up. We double dip back for the spinners. So we're fishing Monday, Tuesday back Monday night for the spinners, and then we leapfrog our way up stream. It's very, it's fast. It's a fascinating program. Starts, is the, the water starts getting warmer, yeah. right? So it, as it starts going up, so we follow the hatch. That's how we start the season. Yeah. So it's half the fun is kind of looking for where the hatch is going to be. Yes. You know, it's all part of the game. But uh, in general, if you want to catch more fish, uh, nymphing's the ticket. Uh, you know, they're eating 85% of their diet is under the water. So, you know, you got to get down and dig them out. And the, 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 the style of fishing that I have seen the biggest change in in the last 10 years is streamer fishing. Mm -hmm. um, in what way? They are building rods now for specific, specifically for people to streamer fish. Um, 10 years ago, you'd see a, a zonker was considered like progressive, like, oh, look at that guy, he's fishing a, you know, he's fishing a big woolly bugger almost. So now you'll see somebody you know, they're fishing seven, eight inch streamers this big. Yeah. They're bombing, they have actual streamer rods. Yeah. And that's the one I've seen, that's the style I've seen progress the most. There's a couple of people in town here, Nick Groves and Jason King, um, that they have just gone way to the next level with this. They're, they're, they're tying, they're obsessed with it. And I get it, it's all about the strip and the, when they hit the fish, they hit tanks, these two guys. And you know when they get that initial strike the adrenaline of it mm -hmm. is what pulled them into it right but you know that's the that's the beautiful thing about fly fishing you could i could go out with three people one of them's going to go nymph one's going to go streamer fish i'm going to sit on the bank and maybe catch a hatch see y'all at the car yeah and it's very common on this river to see people slugging around with three rods in their hand at one time yeah you'll see that a lot out here yeah yeah um will will these brown trout chase streamers all season uh, I think so. Yeah. Um, there's people that swear that when there is a, when there's a streamer hit, it's on. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know enough about it to, to uh, do it, but I don't do a lot of streamer fishing, but I, I really do enjoy it. Uh, I find, you know, if I got two hours to kill, I just sweep through a run and then, and I'm good. There's people that will walk the entire, there's some people leave two cars and go. But, yeah, yeah. Um, I think early in the morning, before they get their feed bag on and, and in the evening, that's another thing I see a lot here is the evening fishing is, is uh, it's, it's really common. You know, when I'm leaving at night, I'll see people coming in with their headlights. Mm -hmm. I mean, their headlamps on and fishing uh, mice at night, they're fishing mice at night. Yeah. I mean, I, what's, what's, what's the big game that these brown trout get to be? I mean, can you catch if I told you fish I've lost in this river that it's, um, it's staggering. It's, uh, so a trophy, what, what do people travel here, you know, if they're looking for that opportunity to catch a big brown? A 20-inch brown would be considered trophy standards. Okay. And then we have the next up 20. So every time you step on this river, you have a chance, a legitimate chance of tangling, tangling with a 20-inch brown. Okay. There's just enough around that... They're not always around, but if you keep fishing enough, you will come across one. Mm -hmm. And then we have the next level up. You know, we always call them the next level fish. You get to the 23, 24 range. Okay. And then. Then Brownzilla. Brownzilla. <laughs> like, I, I lost a fish four years ago, and it's haunting me to this day. And it, it I, like, I've caught 24 inch Browns before. This felt like, what the. What is happening here? Um, I've seen them caught. I think, I think Rob Rob's caught 20, 28 inch brown here. The biggest I've ever caught is twenty six. Rob, what's your biggest? Just just shy of twenty eight. Just shy of twenty eight. And I've heard of thirties. <laughs> I've heard of thirties caught on here. That's a huge brown. That is a, that's incredible. It's huge. That's incredible. So it, it is a it is a, um, a, a a wonderful fishery for big fish as well. Every, every run on this section of river. 
has at least one trophy brown in it. Wow. Hey, Armin Bishop Miller, love your shows. When can I catch them? Uh, Armin, if you're talking about uh, tight loops and, and or tight lines and tailing loops. Uh, we are going to venture to do this every Wednesday. Um, yeah, this is great. I love it. Even when we're traveling, shooting the new fly fisher uh, and the Orvis guide to fly fishing, we will attempt every Wednesday at noon Eastern to uh, to do a Facebook Live, depending on where we are. Now, I'll, I'll preface that by saying that sometimes we're in in remote areas where Wi-Fi isn't the greatest or or what have you. So, uh, but what we will do is is attempt to to do them every Wednesday. Uh, and if you don't see them live on Facebook, they get uploaded on Sunday onto our YouTube channel uh, at the new Fly Fisher TV. Um, as well, if you're talking, Armin, if you're talking about the new Fly Fisher television show, uh, we can be seen on WFN in the United States, Sportsman Channel Canada here in, here in Canada. Um, and then every Saturday morning at nine Eastern, there's a live chat on YouTube where you can see all the new episodes uh, that have aired that week. So if you that's don't- That's on Saturday? That's on Saturday mornings. Okay on the YouTube channel, uh, it's, the show goes live, uh, and then it stays up there for, uh, for as long as YouTube continues. So, uh, it's a, it's a good program. You know, our, our, our mandate is to get people, um, fly fishing, to keep them fly fishing and to educate on where to go, what to do and who to fish with. So that's what, that's, that's where you can see us. Um, Shive 28 Brown sounds like a fishtail. Sheila, uh -huh. <laughs> it's the one, that's the one big one he's got. Yeah. Um, I've uh, seen him, I've seen him. Yeah, Sean yeah. Baker, uh, is it overcrowded the first couple of weeks during the opener? Great question, Sean. <clears throat> the answer is no. Um, the thing up here in Ontario, which is different than in New York, is the, the, the trout season opens April 1st. So up here we have opening day. It's Christmas Eve is opening Eve here. Opening day is Christmas day. And I find the day of opener, you get traditions. You get dad, uncle, cousin, you know, tradition this, tradition, tradition that. Same people have been fishing every opener. Mm -hmm. Some of them will never fish again the rest of the year. Sunday, the crowds have dropped 50% by Tuesday or Wednesday, it's it's back to just how it is. Solo time. Solo time, yeah. Now, are there opportunities where you can fish the river, fish fish the rivers in the area and not see anybody else? Absolutely, yeah. See, that's this fantastic. river as well. That's amazing because you know Fergus is. It took me an, an hour and thirty six minutes yeah. to leave from my house in downtown Toronto to the shop. Um, and all along the way, you're crossing tributaries of the Grand and the Grand itself. I mean, there, yeah. there's so All much water to fish water here. around here if you like uh, fishing brook trout. Yeah. But here, you, you know, the rule of thumb is we give, you know, 100 feet. Yeah. That's when it's crowded, like, you know. <laughs> but I think because of the, the, you know, the special regs, it keeps. Yeah. And you know half the people up here. So let's talk about the special regulations. Other than single barbless, is that is that the only ones that are there, or what other regulations <laughs> to, are barbless, in place to protect these fish? Single barbless, artificial only. No organic bait. No no worms, no minnows, no leeches, um, and catch and release. And that's what makes this fishery so great. Um, we've talked about the hatches and how they go off. Let's talk about some some personal favorites of yours. Uh, what do you want to start with, wet flies or dry flies? Obvious answer is whatever hatch is happening at the time is your favorite. But um, hey, look, Fergus population is going up by one. Sean Baker's moving moving here in June. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, well. I'm going to tell you the, the best hatch I've ever experienced in my life. I'm, I'm not joking when I tell you this. It was a BWO hatch. This was one day though. This was a one day thing. And it was in May and it was freezing cold this day. Freezing cold, windy. It was a May day where I had a toque on with gloves. And this hatch went on. It was a biblical proportions. Like it was eerie. There was probably 500 sparrows in the air. The hatch went probably half a kilometer. It started at 10.30 in the morning and it ended at 2.30 in the afternoon. 
Oh, seriously? Went on for four hours. Four, four and hours. It was biblical. I've never seen anything before it like that or anything after it. It was like I could not believe I was in the middle of this. And it was so windy. Every single fish in the Grand River was coming up like that. Big, huge fish, smaller ones. The whole river was just bubbling. But it was so windy that day mm -hmm. that I couldn't even get it out 40 feet. It was just getting knocked down, knocked down, knocked down. And there was this huge brown. It's probably 25, 26 inches, probably 60 feet back. And I couldn't get to it. So I had to, I had to make terms with it that I couldn't, I couldn't get that fish. So I just came in and I just waited until something came up close where I could just kind of roll cast out. I ended up with two really, two big fish that day. If the, if there was no wind, it would have been a day that I might've quit fishing. Really? Uh, really? Yeah, it was, it was like, it was insane. It was insane. So that was a BWO hatch. So let, let me stop you there for a second. So when you've got a hatch like that, that, that is literally going off like crazy. Yeah. Um, I showed you an episode in Wyoming just before we started this where the guide, there was a pseudo hatch going off and the guide actually made a conscious decision to, to go completely opposite of what the actual hatch was happening on the water. In that sort of situation, would you continue to throw something um, that every other fish is seeing or do you want to go throw something a little bit different, whether it be a different bug no, a different, or a different size? we're throwing exactly what's going on. Really? So even though there's a huge hatch going off, you, you still are confident that that fish is going to pick your fly out of the hundreds well, that are there? that's what you're up against. That's, that's what you're up against is because um, your one little fly has to go in the middle of a thousand other ones. Um, but that's what they're gearing on. That's right. what they're taking. You know, so if you throw out a caddis and there's a BWO hatch on you know who knows anything i think i think i think the key to that though it, it to stand out from the crowd if you will is to throw something that's that's a little bit different so if you're throwing if you're th you know if if there's a size 20 going off you know go 18. so throw, show them something a little bit different so that they they may notice it in in the in the masses of what's going on you know and a, another thing or is that do, just total bullshit? well you know i've seen so many crazy things happen out here i, I never tell someone not to do something because, right um but what you have to do is zero in on one fish cut limit your casting yep you know every time you throw a line on the water you're knocking the lot you know you're potentially putting down fish right so our rule of thumb is if we see one fish rise it gets our attention two gets our ears up we see that fish coming up three times, that fish is working. Right, you've patterned it. We've patterned it. And a lot of times they walk up the river, they'll walk up and then they'll go back. And we'll watch, the hardest thing in fly fishing, when you're dry fly fishing, which is, I think, is to not cast. I know that, but I think that's the most fun. It's the most fun, Yeah. but it's the hardest thing to do, especially when nicer fish are rising yeah. in front of you, but you're holding off. So what you do is you will throw out, actually Rob taught me a nice trick a few years back. You throw the first cast out, get the distance, strip it in and hold the fly in your finger. And then when you see that fish walking back up, throw right at it. So the key is when you see all these fish rising, accuracy. Uh -huh. So put it right on their nose. I'm talking, you know, there's 10 fish coming up and you know, something crazy like that. Pick the one out and throw right at that one fish. So we try to match the hatch here. Okay. But, the, but my favorite hatch, that was just one biblical day. Okay. Uh, which I'll never forget that day. I've seen crazy caddis hatches too. But uh, my favorite hatch is the Hendrickson hatch. Right in the it's, spring. It's the first hatch. It's the one everyone's been waiting for. Um, you know, with my old eyes, it's hard for me sometimes to see these little size 20 flies I'm throwing. You're throwing these big, big flies out at them. Um, it's usually the first, you know, the first time of year where you're out there and your jacket's off. Mm-hmm. Uh, springs out. It's the release of winter. It's the first one yeah. and, and the hatches are incredible. Um, the downside to it is I've seen hatches that it's just a cloud of flies. Like you're looking, you're looking across at a cedar backdrop Yeah. and you can't even see through sometimes they're so th thick, but if you get a really sunny day, nothing might rise. Mm -hmm. You know, we were just talking about the other day is how, you know, you could go to the exact same spot two days, catch the same hatch one day, you light it up one day you won't see a fish rise yeah but that all comes with it but i think hendrickson's are my favorite the, but the um the uh the unsung hero last year was the cahill hatch oh yeah yeah that was the unsung that was the hatch of the year last year that went on for a long time 
in the in the summer. Just throughout the just throughout the weeks of the summer. Yeah, and it was a real, it was a real thick hatch, and it went on for a few weeks. And uh, we we're still throwing dries in you know July. Wow. Yeah, it was it was a it was a really good year last year. The year before was a big caddis year, so you know of course everyone you know in the off season ties a thousand caddis flies and then. And then, and then last year was all Cahill. So we've talked about uh, wet flies a little bit. Um, we've talked about dries. I come from the school up north where I've been working with um, uh, developing big brook trout fisheries in yeah, the far north so nice of Ontario. Where you go? Oh yeah, it is, it's heaven. Um, and I've been spoiled by being able to throw terrestrials for brook trout that, I mean, the biggest one we I've released. Never done it. No? No, the biggest no. one we released last summer was 24 and a half inches, rookie, and it ate a um, Chernobyl ant. So I'm spoiled by wow. those big terrestrials and moving a lot of water. Is there an opportunity in this region for people to throw big terrestrials for mice, not at midnight? The problem with that is if we get like a, a big hopper hatch, you know, the, the hoppers are out. A lot of times it falls into August when the water's warm. Ah, uh, I see. So it may be windy and lots of protein in the water, but ethically you're not fishing for right. these fish. Yeah, so we kind of, you know, I, I don't think I've ever fished that, you know, the hopper hatch. I hear of it. Um, on the Grand, I don't hear much of it. Usually when, when it's going on, it's in the heat of the summer and, and the, the rivers are kind of sleeping, so. So because, because, you know, when we get up, into the rivers of the Albany watershed, you know, as soon as the ice is out, we're fishing brook trout. And, you know, the growth window for those fish for big protein offerings is so small that, you know, you can throw a mouse through a pattern when the water temperature's in the, in the you know, high 30s, low 40s, and they're gonna crush it, right? Wow. It'd be interesting to see <clears throat> if in the early spring, if those brown trout will key in on something that is a meaty offering. Oh yeah, the, the, um, you know, the, the guys who fish streamers and, and grills, you know, they're, some of them are this big. Yeah, yeah. well yeah, it, and I'm sure people have heard me say this in the past, it's, but we- It's crazy, I've caught, actually, I was with a guy last year who caught a 14 inch brown with a seven inch streamer. I had a brook trout barf up at eight, eight inch walleye last summer up wow. there like so i i think that yeah. there's opportunity here to experiment and to play with well, yeah. uh, robert rob do you know anything about throwing big terrestrials in the in the springtime for browns is that something that you guys do here or is that sort of unfounded territory you, you'll get guys that will probe search yeah. for fish with terrestrials not so much in the spring because there's not that many around there's not many yeah big, uh, big bugs around, but going later into the season, especially in the fall, yeah, um, it's it's not much different than throwing a big streamer and just searching for fish, right? But right. it's certainly not unheard of. Cool, that's amazing. That's uh, you know, I always say, um, you know, when I have novices out with me, you know, one of the one of the things here on the other side of the spectrum is how how a twenty four inch brown will take a size twenty two nip. Yeah. And it's hard to pull a fly out of your fly box and show somebody that's kind of just a novice that this is what we're <laughs> This is what they're eating, things. yeah. And, you know, I know Rob has an expression, you know, whales eat krill. They just eat thousands. Yeah, totally. And, and I remember I, I explained it last year to a kid. I said, uh, you, you and I go to McDonald's. Um, he'll eat a thing of French fries one at a time till he's full. Mm -hmm. I'll eat a Big Mac. Yeah, there so you I go. Call it, so when you're nymphing, they're just eating one fry at a time. When they're taking a big streamer, it's just like taking one big shot of protein at once. But there is a lot of people that catch big fish with big streamers on. Um, Sean Baker, is there brook trout, are there brook trout opportunities in the Grand as well? I've never caught one in the Grand. Um, with that said, you could go 15, 20 minutes either side of uh, Fergus. And um, the rule of thumb to that is when you're driving by and you see a little, if you see a little creek and you say, I bet you there's brook trout in there, 90% of the time there is. Yeah. 
There's brook trout all over but the you place know, here. It's, you know, how many times you drive past the same place and never get out and fish it? Yeah. And you're still 10 years later going, I bet you there's brook trout in there. Yeah. Get out, park the car, and go fish it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Rod Murray, always threw grasshoppers on local streams in August, but have never seen them on the Grand. Uh, Pete LaDuc, Mark, is that where they say big bait, big fish? As to what Rob or um, Mikey just said, you know, sometimes these big fish will take tiny, tiny, tiny bugs. So... Um, do not discount. Yeah, they just see thousands of them. Thousands of them, right? So, all right. Um, anything else you want to talk about, Mike? No. We're good? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's really nice seeing you. It's, I, yeah. know, I know how busy you are coming yeah. up here. It's quite an effort. Yeah. Well, you know what? I've I've learned over the years that when you fish with the guys from the Grand River Grand River Outfitting, um, you don't only you're not a, you're not a client. Uh, and the old cliche says you become friends. But you know we go out together, we drink beers together, we fish together. It's uh, it's a fantastic culture here in Ontario, yeah. Southern Ontario. Um, if you want to get in on on tying lessons, or if you want to be a part of <laughs> the culture that happens here with with whether it's um, There's always something going on. Always on something going on in the yeah, calendar. Someone coming in. I think uh, Nick's coming in this Saturday. There's always a local tire coming in, teaching local patterns. Yeah. Like they usually mix it up, uh, pair it up with a brewery, one of the micro breweries. So yeah. you could come in, you could see the people. Yeah. Learn. Um, share beer, make some new friends, and 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 more importantly, um, get some awesome fishing buddies that uh, you know everybody and, can learn you from. You know this this community is so small. Um, 98% of the people will go out of their way to help a, yeah. a new person that's, you know, right away we see someone walk in, we kind of see them looking around and that you'll see nine out of 10 times someone giving them flies, yeah. showing them what's going on, yeah. kind of pulling them away from a spot, telling them to go over there. The yeah. people up here are great. The community's really tight. And, and the fishing's and fantastic. Close. You could get here in an hour and a half. Yeah, um, absolutely. Get off the water. There's kind of, There's pubs here. You could you know yeah there were pubs here still 11 you can go to the pub afterwards <laughs> but it's a, it's a fantastic place i recommend uh any level of angler right come up here that's key that's key so for more information uh let's go through some of this administrative stuff more information on mike and uh, mikey metcalf yeah. and the shop go to ontarioflyfishing.ca um f with respect to mike's personal fly casting yeah, business uh, metcalfflycast.ca and instagram uh, at Metcalf Flycast. Yeah, yeah, fantastic people. Yes, it's uh, great seeing you. Likewise. So for the new fly fisher, you can check us out um, on WFN in the United States, on uh, Sportsman Channel Canada, in Canada, uh, and of course every Saturday the shows are being released on YouTube. Don't forget to enter the Algoma. Uh, greatest catch contest you can find out about that at www.algomacountry.com uh, submit your picture for a chance to win awesome yeti gear and a gopro 7 uh, and i think that's about it we're going to see you next wednesday here on tailing loops and tight lines or tight lines and tailing loops michael my yeah, pleasure my friend you. it's good to see you here and healthy yes. and uh we'll see everybody Happy down the road everybody be safe absolutely take care of yourselves